Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining. We've got a really great group of individuals here. We're going to talk about um, the ARP fund, the learning gaps, and our next steps for tutoring with two really notable individuals. We've got representation from AASA, the School Superintendents Association, and we've got uh, Guilford County Public Schools on our on our panelists as well. Um, we've got. Let me. There we go. Um, what we're going to accomplish today. So walking away from this webinar, we're really hoping that the folks on this uh, call are going to have some actionable insights for navigating these post ESSER and American Rescue Plan um, programs, figure out what those challenges are, how to overcome those challenges, and then from there, build out some sustainable tutoring strategies moving forward in your uh, district and division. This is a casual conversation, so I definitely encourage any um, input, insight, Q&A is always welcome. And you'll see throughout some of these slides, we will also have some questions for you. So feel free to drop those in the chat. And then also you'll have some questions um, or feedback at the end that you'll have the opportunity to ask as well. So I'm gonna pass this over to my colleague at Pearl. This is Nate Casey, he is going to moderate the rest of this for us. But again, please feel free, ask questions in the chat and we'll jump in and um, put those to our panelists. Nate. Great. Thank you so much, Haley. Um, I'm excited to welcome two amazing guests. My first guest is Sasha Podelsky, the Director of Advocacy at the National Superintendents Association, and also my good friend, Kara Hamilton, who I've known for quite a while now, who's the Director of Tutorial Program in Guilford, North Carolina. And if you don't know about uh, Guilford, I definitely say dive in and learn more about them. They are, in my opinion, the, the most successful district-led tutoring program in the nation. Their statistics are quite phenomenal. So if you want to learn more about them, we'll give those resources at the end. So let's jump right in. Um, I'm going to start with you, Sasha. Um, can you tell us about your work with the National Superintendents Association and really dive in and summarize those critical findings from your most recent ESSER-focused surveys. I know you've done a number of different surveys over the course of the ESSER funding, um, and the one I'm speaking of is the one I think you released in August of 2023. Yeah, sure. Great to be here. Um, yeah, I've been with AASA, the School Superintendents Association, for uh, almost 13 years, and um, this is our fourth report that we have done on the use of American Rescue Plan funds. Uh, and uh, we started right at uh, in July of 2021, um, right when the funding first came out, uh, to figure out what uh, districts were going to be doing with this funding. And now, you know, it's been another two and a half years, and we're still digging into this uh, and reporting on the findings of how districts are using the funds, the trends in terms of funding usage, and as well as how there are differences in who, how districts spend it, depending on their local and student population. And then looking ahead uh, this year, we also asked some questions about what they're thinking in terms of what will happen when the funding runs out and what plans they have uh, when uh, we hit September 2024, which is the obligation deadline for the American Rescue Plan. Uh, and uh, in terms of our work, um, the, uh, you know, it's, it's our superintendents are the CEOs of school districts. So we really see this as an opportunity to um, provide um, a really important perspective on the use of this funds. Uh, and uh, unlike other surveys that have been done when it comes to you know, a snapshot of looking at data in terms of surveys that have been conducted or looking at um, reports or plans themselves that have been posted from the school districts. We feel like our membership, which uh, I should note is disproportionately rural compared to the country, um, uh, is is best uh, positioned to provide that kind of information. And um, as you'll note here, um, we did conduct this with 650 superintendents across 47 states, two thirds of which identify districts with fewer than a thousand students, which is uh, almost 20% more uh, than is actually the case nationally. So it is representative of our membership, but not necessarily representative of the country as a whole. Quick question for you there, Sasha. Um, and that is, is that all specifically superintendents or is it also like uh, assistant superintendents? Can you give us a sense as who the respondents actually are beyond that? 
I can't uh, because we, as a, oh, well, our membership, we don't we don't necessarily um, do that for the survey. We don't ask the exact title within the district. Oh, that's great. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, in terms of what we found, uh, there have been very consistent priorities uh, for our members since July of 2021, um, and the the name of the game is adding instructional time. And so, all of the funding that they have been uh, uh, given. Um, is in some way connected to uh, making up the time that was lost, of course, during COVID. Um, and so what that looks like is a huge emphasis, of course, on actually increasing the amount of instructional time and opportunities kids have, whether that's after school, before school, during the weekends, and then, of course, summer programming has been enormous. Um, and tied with that, in additional time that students are spending learning is investing in high quality curriculum materials. You can't just have a program and expect it to run itself. You need to invest in the curriculum and materials to actually have that program. And similarly, you have to have staff for those, those programs. So um, uh, adding specialist staff, particularly instructional staff, has been incredibly important. We've seen a lot of districts invest in, um, in literacy coaches and, and uh, invest in tutors, of course. Um, and that's been an important piece of this, as well as uh, investing in um, teacher planning and professional development. And, and what's interesting about this year's survey, unlike the past few years, is that we're really seeing an uptick in terms of investing in teacher planning and PD and a slight decline in uh, specialist staff uh, that we've added. And the reason for that is that we're ending, you know, the this school year, essentially, with the money running out. And so it makes a lot more sense to be focused on building up the professionals that you're going to keep, um, making sure they have the robust training and, um, uh, and, and expertise that they will need to carry forward these programs, since it most likely you will have to be um, losing people uh, who you've hired uh, temporarily using American Rescue Plan funds uh, who've been managing your program. So that's kind of where we see um, an increase and also a, a decrease this year that we did not see in the past. Really quick, so like that same thought, um, I know that not all schools are Title I schools or we're going to receive Title I funding, but a lot of schools do receive that Title II funding focused on professional development. So I assume that they're looking towards in many ways that professional development budget line as a as an opportunity um, to use a Title II funds and hopefully increase Title II funds after ARP. Are you getting a sense of that at all? I'm not. I, you know, we really did not ask them questions about Title II in the survey. It was strictly focused on on ARP. Um, and I, I, and again, I think Title II is such a small amount of money that most districts receive that I couldn't. Uh, you know, I think they probably use it very flexibly. Uh, and I wouldn't. You know, some of them may use it for uh, you know class size reductions and other things. So I, I just don't know what they're using side the Title II dollars for. Um, but in terms of differences that we perceived from how districts of different locales were spending. Their, their funding. We saw that rural districts were much less likely to use funding um, for uh, high intensity tutoring than our suburban and urban districts. Uh, we speculated this could be because um, class sizes in rural districts are already fairly small, as well as staffing shortages in rural districts are incredibly high. So they may not, they may not have had the pool by which to, to conduct those kinds of um, tutoring programs. Um, or, or perhaps they could do more uh, intensive interventions in the classroom given the size of classes. Um, those were just kind of speculation though. Um, we saw rural districts were more focused on prioritizing instructional materials than suburban and urban districts. Suburban and ur urban districts were more focused on, um, again, their summer programs in particular and their, and their extended day programs. Um, Suburban districts in particular were very much prioritizing SEL investments as well. Um, and we saw an uptick in rural and suburban districts investing in data systems and literacy. Uh, this was interesting because the year prior, we saw urban districts really investing in data systems and literacy. And so it seems like, you know, they, they were kind of leading this effort to kind of make sure, again, as we invest in curriculum and, and instruction, that, you know, we're, we're making sure that our, our teachers and staff really understand what they're reviewing um, in terms of those materials and how to understand that the, the, the scores they're getting back and, and the assessment data that they're getting back. So um, it seemed like a very smart thing to, to continue to invest in those systems in light of um, the other investments districts have made in curriculum and instruction. And, and in regards to like the response, the responses comparing, and maybe you had different kinds of questions for the different ESSER surveys that you did, but I'm just curious um, if you extrapolated from like the most recent survey and you look back at the last survey or the survey before, 
are, are there just clear indicators that shifts are being made because of the, the, the cliff? Yes. And I think we're going to talk about that in the next set of slides, I believe, where we're talk we're going to talk about the um, kind of the shifts and adjustments that we're have, are going are, are being made right now um, as a result of the, the ending of the funding. Great. Thank you. All right. I'd love to turn it over to um, Kara. So, Kara, I'd love to have our folks learn a bit more about Guilford's tutoring program and how you addressed learning gaps effectively. I, um, obviously, you know that I'm a big fan. So, I, I, you know, it's just exciting to have um, people learn about the work that you're doing in North Carolina. Thank you. Thank you, Nate. It's wonderful to have a fan. Um, <laughs> it's wonderful um, that uh, uh, how highly you speak about what we're doing. It's it's something that we're very passionate about. Um, but yeah, just to provide a little bit of context about Guilford County Schools, um, we're the third largest PSU in the state of North Carolina behind Wake County and Charlotte Mecklenburg. Um, we serve nearly 68,000 students across 124 schools. We have a 63% student poverty rate, um, and then also 121 languages and dialects are spoken. So that just gives you sort of a, a broad um, makeup of, of our district. Um, but really, as urban districts across the nation are, are really aiming to address declines in student proficiency, research shows, I mean, it indicates three strategies to incorporate. And one of those is expanding learning time, um, uh, high intensity or dosage, um, tutoring, and then acceleration, not remediation. So making sure that students really have access to the grade level content. So specifically for high doses tutoring, um, which is very evidence-based, it's an evidence-based approach to accelerating student learning. Um, it has that goal of meeting the needs of students who have fallen behind through, you know, one-on-one -on -one or very small group differentiated sport. So we in GCS have really leaned into the research of the National Student Support Accelerator, which is out of Stanford University. And we have built our high doses tutoring program with a district centralized approach. Um, the research around high impact tutoring, um, I, there's there's a, a lot of really promising research that's coming out, um, but it shows that it, it's tutoring delivered three or more times a week by consistent train tutors using really high quality instructional materials and data to inform that instruction. So it, it's um, it's shown as being one of the most effective academic interventions. And um, I believe it provides close to four months of additional learning in elementary literacy and almost 10 months in high school math, which is straight out of the, the National Student Support Accelerator. But what makes our program unique um, is that we have really uh, centralized the, the tutoring efforts across the district. So our tutoring department operates essentially as a tutoring organization within a school district. Um, our tutors are community members, they're retired educators, they're previous educators that may be looking for a more flexible schedule. Um, we partner with our local universities. We're very fortunate to be uh, to have some wonderful higher ed institutions, you know, very close to us. North Carolina a and State University, University of North Carolina at Greensboro, Guilford College, High Point University, I could go on and on. Um, and we interview and hire undergraduate students to tutor in our schools and we pay a, a pretty competitive wage. Um, we also contract with two of those universities, uh, North Carolina a and State and UNCG to offer assistantships to graduate students as high dosage tutors. So through these university partnerships, we've really seen several instances where um, undergraduate or even graduate students that may not have thought about careers in K-12 teaching. Um, they've gone on to fill vacant teaching positions. So we've, we're sort of hitting that teacher pipeline as well, um, which has been really neat to see. Um, but one of, one of the, the core foundations of our program is that it, it remains important for us or for our tutors to not undo anything that's being done in the classroom. So our tutors receive training on our district core curriculum. We partner with our mathematics and literacy departments um, to really provide that content training that aligns with our North Carolina state standards as part of that tutor onboarding process and, and continued um, professional development as a tutor. 
Um, and this year, we through the end of October, we've placed over 500 tutors um, in over 100 schools and served almost 9,000 students already this school year. So we're, we're on track to, um, uh, to keep reaching more students even uh, than we did uh, last year. So very exciting. That's awesome. I'd love to learn more about particularly just the social emotional side of it. You know, uh, anecdotally, a lot of what we hear is that the power is in that in-person tutoring, which is such a core piece of the TQIS standards that that um, we all try to adhere to out of the National Student Support Accelerator. So if you could talk a little bit more, more about the socioeconomic and emotional side of things that you're that you're addressing, that'd be awesome. Sure, sure. Absolutely. So um, some of those model elements that the Student Support Accelerator puts out, um, some of those model elements are consistent, well-supported tutors. So really tutors that are skilled at relationship building. Um, they're knowledgeable about the content, but they're also culturally competent. So, um, and effective tutors really can be from a range of backgrounds, as I noted earlier with, um, really the different types of tutors that that we employ. They range from retired educators to undergraduate college students. So um, it, it not only is the high dosage tutoring a focus on academic support, it's very much a relationship-based tutoring approach where students are able to connect um, with another significant adult to fill some of those socio-emotional needs and really support the whole child. Um, you know, we hear from schools all the time that students are asking to meet with their tutors and really looking forward to that time that they spend with them. So we love um, hearing that feedback. Um, and really, when the student holds the tutor accountable, um, it, you know, it, it just really shows that they're, they, um, they rely on that consistent connection. Um, we're yeah. seeing and hearing about students advocating for themselves, which is also really amazing. But also in our strategic partnerships with our local universities, you know, one of those North Carolina a and State University is the largest HBCU in the nation. They're the number one producer of degrees awarded to African-Americans in North Carolina. Um, not only are they a top HBCU for STEM majors, but they also produce the highest number of Black engineers in the nation. And we feel that this is just a very powerful experience for our students to see themselves in their tutor and really reinforce the options um, that are out there for them as a historically underrepresented race in the, in the STEM field. Awesome. I think that, you know, for me, that that's been one of the most profound um, and elegant pieces of your program is really the diversity, because I know that uh, we have an HBCU in North Carolina A&T, but UNCG is also highly diverse. Yes. Um, and so, you know, what I've loved about your program is that you've got, you know, those STEM folks coming in from both universities, you've got schools of education that are participating. Um, and the idea of building that teacher pipeline is is really awesome. I'd love to hear more. Um, I think from our audience, just you know, tell us what you think. We'd love to have you put into the chat any challenges that you're facing in supporting the SEL needs of your students. And and Kara, that's like the next question. You know, like letting us better understand some of the challenges and successes that you've had for the program. Yeah, well, I think um, uh, of course uh, one of the challenges uh, it has was really implementation. You know, we always joke that when we started on this journey, like, well, tutoring really started in the district at the onset of the pandemic. Um, but when uh, you know classes start, students started coming back uh, in person. And we really had the need to develop systems and processes to really scale this. Um, but we joked that, you know, we were building the airplane as we were flying it. Um, and I think a lot of districts can sort of empathize with that as well. You know, we were trying to figure out how we were going to make this happen. And it comes to a point where you just do. And if something doesn't work, you reevaluate, you adapt and you overcome. So we did a lot of that. Um, but I think we were fortunate to have the right people in the right places. I think it was also uh, one thing that made it very successful, I think for us, 
in sort of this grassroots effort um, that, uh, you know, we involved our community in. Um, I think that it was, that's what enabled us to be able to scale. So um, we had the right people in the right places and we have a, a wonderful community who just want to help. Um, so yeah. we, we really uh, capitalized on that. That's great. Sasha, I want to stay on this slide and kind of turn it over to you for a moment. Um, I know that you're going to talk a bit about the ARP spending, but love to hear from you in that um, urban versus rural. It was interesting to hear from you that that you have a lot of, I think you said you have a lot of rural um, superintendents that are or superintendents offices that are members. Can you speak to this as well? Yeah, I, I, certainly we see differences in, in both the short and long term spending. And, um, you know, we divvied up the spending by those two features. I should have mentioned that at the beginning. We first talked about, you know, what are you doing immediately? And that's the, what are you doing with these dollars immediately? And, and that was the focus was certainly in, on instruction and adding instructional time. But we also um, have some data on on what we think are, are the long term systemic investments that are possible. Could you go to the next slide? Haley. Um, thanks. And so um, when when we did that, uh, you know, we had a, a, you know, a conversation with our members about, you know, this is this is an unprecedented amount of money. How are you thinking about it? And there was some sense that, you know, folks were just going to write ARP plans and they were going to just do what a lot of plans do that districts write, strategic plans and otherwise, you know, sit somewhere in a, in a desk, um, not be revisited and reexamined and refreshed. Um, but that was certainly not the case with American Rescue Plan funding. And so a lot of districts um, were, and as many as 84% in June indicated that they were in the process of revising their ARP spending plans over the next 15 months. Um, now, one of the reasons for that was, uh, of course, inflation. Inflation and costs was, were a lot different in 2021 than they were in 2023. Um, but it was also feedback from educators that was a really important driver of changing their, their directions or, or their priorities when it came to this. Um, and and a, a, a chief among them was the need to further prioritize the social and emotional needs of their students. Um, that's not to say that feedback from parents or you know just looking at assessment data or other things didn't play factors well into these things but you know I, I think there was some sense in in the media and otherwise that um you know there was there were these plans that were created and then districts were just kind of prod, plodding along you know doing the plan um and it seems to us like this is not the case at all based on our data these are very much living documents that are constantly um being refreshed and um and revised based on you know the input that they're getting from from educators and from parents in particular But I guess, you know, what you were asking about just now, Nate, was the the locale issue. And certainly, um, you know, urban districts, we noted, um, have have really emphasized the importance of directing more of their money um, uh, towards SEL of students. That was a significant uptick that we noticed when it came to how we're changing what we're spending our dollars on versus what we intended to. And as and, and SEL was actually the number one long-term systemic priority for school districts overall, regardless of locale. Um, and even as that is the case, districts in, in urban areas reported that they still needed to prioritize it further in terms of their spending. Um, suburban districts interestingly said that feedback from educators was really driving their spending shifts. Um, and rural districts um, indicated that cost and inflation was a consideration, most likely because um, many of them, based on the, the long-term systemic um, uh, kind of spending that they did, um, it emphasized um, are really leaning into construction and facility projects right now in this last year. And so as a result, it's just, those are just more price sensitive, inflation sensitive kinds of um, projects. Um, and that's why they are, uh, they cited cost and inflation as really the significant driver in changing what they were spending versus what they had planned to spend. It's so interesting to think about, I guess, in many cases, suburban districts um, that are sort of part of sprawl may have much newer schools and are dealing less with deprecating um, infrastructure, just buildings and HVAC systems and all that. So they may have been able to reallocate some of those funds towards some of the more instructional pieces of, of 
lesser rather than trying to, you know, let's make it so it's not freezing <laughs> during the winter or what have you. Absolutely. I mean, you can't offer, I think there's been this, uh, unfortunate kind of thing where folks think that, you know, putting in air conditioning or replacing HVAC systems is not directly related to learning. But I can tell you if you're in a boiling hot classroom or a freezing cold one, it's really hard to learn. And so we don't see the the updates, especially those kinds of updates to facilities as not directly tied to instruction. It's also directly tied to personnel retention. That's the data is right there to sh share that, you know, teachers and educators want to work in comfortable conditions as well. Um, and, and so the idea that there's somehow this weird disconnect in investing in, in buildings, especially given that this is one-time funding um, and we've we don't have a federal school infrastructure program of any kind or funding source of any kind, and so much of it is based on local tax and property and levies that we can sometimes access and other times, and depending on the community, can't. To us, it makes perfect sense that some of these much less resource districts would utilize ARP to make some very critical facility uh, uh, upgrades um, to the benefit that will benefit their students, not only now, but in much, much more in the future um, with these funds. And so I, I guess I, this slide should have been first. I didn't realize how we were doing this, but the, um, the systemic investments, as I met, that I mentioned, the top priority is expanding whole child supports and services. And then um, the second investment was really on renovating buildings. Um, and the third was engaging high school students. So um, this was actually flipped compared to the data that we had from 21 and 22, where high school student engagement was actually second and, and renovating buildings. But again, I think that's just because Again, far and away, um, the top priority was that was expanding those whole child supports and really emphasizing uh, that through the, the hiring of additional staff, particularly mental health support staff. Um, and that is what districts chose to, to really think about as they were expending these dollars um, over the over the time period that they have. And so we're looking at a generation of kids who and, you know, within certain age group and grades that missed, in some cases, really two years of learning a year of learning, um, and that can be defined by those gaps. But I'm wondering, just a quick, if you have any insights on that um, that third priority around high school students, um, was, the, was it the case that they were seeing so many kids that were actually um, off course from graduation that caused that shift in, in funding? Or do you, do, you, do you have a sense as to what was driving that? I mean, I think a lot of it had to do with chronic absenteeism at the at the higher grade level and um, needing to find other ways of reengaging them. Again, offering maybe more night school opportunities than they had in the past, offering different types of curriculum, trying to re trying to to change their CTE offerings, um, but just rethink how they could get these kids back into the classroom and get engaged in the work that they were doing so that they could graduate. Uh, maybe it wasn't beyond time, but you know, eventually. So I think that was you know really front and center as we as we you know think about what districts were doing at to, to, in terms of trying to reconnect with high school students. And then in terms of, you know, again, shifts in long term spending by locale, um, you know, suburban districts uh, um, indicated that they were much more interested in prioritizing funding for special education. Um, but rural districts also interested uh, were more interested than they had been in prior years in terms of their long term spending and goals and programs. Um, urban and rural districts were also more likely to prioritize bilingual educational opportunities. Um, but the big, big thing was, uh, you know, facility upgrades, I think. And then that, and that, you know, really speaks to not just I mentioned rural districts, but also urban districts really spending on, on that. Um, if you look at how a long term priorities by locale. Um, did you have you I, I've read a couple articles recently about districts around the country moving from a five day work week to a four day work week, same pay grade. So part of this is just um, different lifestyle and trying to recruit more teachers because it's a four day work week rather than a five at the same wage. Have you, um, is there any signal coming into the, to AASA and um, regarding that specific movement? No, I think, I think, you know, in a place like Missouri, it's super common these days. In other parts of the country, it's not. Um, I think the research is pretty clear on, on whether it works or not. Uh, but uh, I, we, we have not seen that as a, as a national trend. Got it. It's very regional. Okay. And I'd love for, um, any one of our audience members, if you've got uh, something to share in regards to how your district is spending, we'd love to get that insight as well. So I'm gonna move over to, um, back to, oh, funding sustainability. Let's talk about this a bit. Sorry, I thought we were moving to 
a question for Kara. Go ahead, Sasha. Sorry. Yeah. So uh, again, you know, we know that there's a timeline for spending these funds and it's a very tight timeline for districts. It's really challenging to spend this money this quickly. That's just not how we operate. Um, and, it, and it's not, it's, a, it, it, it's a mixed blessing having all this funding, but then having so little time to spend it. Um, and so we wanted to find out how sustainability factored into these conversations and whether or not it was a factor. And I was pleasantly surprised to see that how much of it was, um, you know, the fact that 44% said sustainability of, of funding was a top priority with, with regards to their spending decisions was actually a, you know, a really nice surprise for me. Um, because again, these are local plans that are driven by community stake and stakeholder input. So at the end of the day, the superintendent and, and the board certainly have a lot of you know, control over, over what happens, but you know, we, we there were specific mandates put in place that required you know, considerable efforts to engage community leaders. And if your community told you, you know what is most important to me, is um is getting some turf on our fields that is what you are going to spend your money doing um because that's that's responsive and in line with the federal mandates um and so the idea that sustainability was a top priority and that that was something that they could really emphasize um was great to see in this um and we didn't see any differences in terms of locale and size of district when it came to this um this one in particular Hey, Nate, I can chime in a little bit just on uh, a, our district's perspective and sort of, you know, again, these are conversations that are coming up about sustainability. And, and um, I think that will certainly be, uh, you know, a challenge. So we're looking at options for, you know, outside funding sources such as grants. You know, how do we top into tap into other philanthropic supports to really help ensure that we can continue to run these programs that we're seeing um, success in. So our superintendent has unveiled uh, the district's new strategic direction um, with one of those focus areas being accelerating learning and specifically strengthening core curriculum and the increased access to high quality instruction. Um, and really expanding the learning recovery efforts through our high dosage tutoring and um, our learning hubs. So uh, she has assembled st some strategic working groups to really examine these initiatives that we've invested in and, and really making it a priority to engage the community, um, gather input from students, parents, tutors, teachers, principals, community organizations, um, and really sharing these are the district's accountability results and making sure that stakeholders are presented with this information. So in our most recent accountability report to our Board of Education, we saw growth in every subgroup at every level on most of our statewide assessments. So really putting you know, those findings out there so that everyone is aware of, of these um, investments. And you know, we're currently working with several research partners, um, the Student Support Accelerator, NWEA and their Road to Recovery. Uh, we're getting ready to dive into a new one with the University of Chicago um, and their education lab to really evaluate the effectiveness of this high dosage tutoring. And, and we really hope to have some student achievement data that mirrors the implementation effort um, and financial investment that we've made in these students uh, with these one-time funds. But we, we certainly think that that will help um, when we're having those sustainability talks and really how we're investing in our you know, big bets for, for the future. Yeah, I've all, and I've been very, very interested, you know, in my conversations with Faith Freeman, specifically about, um, you know, the overall economic impact of the program. I know that there's some other projects that are happening around um, employment readiness and that sort of thing for tutors that are participating as community members, you know, keeping those funds in the community and paying the community the money instead of hiring a third party to come in and be that tutor. You know, there's got to be an impact of, of those funds staying in the community. So I'd, I'd be really curious if like Department of Commerce or something like that would be doing that kind of reporting. Awesome. So in regard to preparing for the fiscal cliff, I'd love to hear from you, Sasha, on this. Yeah. So, you know, it's not, as you can tell from the slide before, you know, this is not coming as a shock. Uh, folks have been thinking about sustainability the, the whole time or, or almost the whole time. And so um, that doesn't mean that it's any less easy to figure out how to to make 
really challenging cuts. And when you have outstanding achievement results like you had that Kara described in her districts, it's heartbreaking to have to start making tough choices about what kids need and making decisions about whether to, you know, to cut summer learning programs that have also been proven to be really effective over the pandemic or to cut specialists who have formed such strong bonds with kids and who still have enormously high caseloads um, are, are really, really challenging, um, you know, fraught decisions for superintendents and their teams. Um, what we saw is that, yeah, the first thing that's going to go is is obviously going to be people, adults. Um, that's that's the that's the first thing that will be that will be cut. Um, and then with that, of course, you know, those adults, that, many of whom are staffing uh, additional programs like our summer learning programs, similarly, those will be going away too. And then generally, there have been a lot of uh, districts that have had to increase staff compensation as a retention tool during the pandemic. Um, that will also go away too. Um, when we look at the trends by locale, suburban districts said that they would be most likely trying to cut expanded learning um, and rural and urban districts said staffing would be their top cut. Um, and I, again, you know, this is, it, it, we saw this coming uh, and, and hopefully many districts planned contracts that were short term for many of these positions, whether they were the, you know, instructional leader of, that they hired or whether they were, you know, again, um, a, a social, social worker, or school counselor that they hired, but it doesn't make it any less easy to, to lose those kinds of positions, particularly when you are starting to see in many places, you know, really strong progress and evidence that these people and programs are making a difference. Yeah, I'd love to, I know your next slide is is really getting into how this is going to affect our students specifically. Yeah, so, yeah, I, yeah I mean, it's all about the kids. And, yeah. and so we wanted to really ask that question and we plan on asking it, of course, you know, again, in the next survey that we do. Um, you know, how do you think students will be impacted? Which students will be most impacted as you have to pare down your offerings and people and programming? Um, and, and so what I thought was really profound was that a third of our respondents said that they felt like all students would be affected equally by this, meaning that the kinds of supports and, and programs and people that they have in place are not necessarily uh, have, you know, um, certainly are, 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 are doing a great work with certain subgroups of kids, certain kids in particular, especially as you see below, students with mental health needs, particularly concerned about what will happen when, when those personnel leave the system, as well as our economically disadvantaged students. But, you know, they are having an impact. And I like to give an example of like, you know, if you have a school nurse in the building, um, and, you know, she's not going to ask, you know, is your family poor before coming in to, to treat you or do you have a disability um, or, you know, do you speak English? She's going to see every single kid who walks through her door and do her very best to help them with whatever medical issue they have. And, and that goes for all, you know, the staff and teachers that we hire. Um, they all are making a difference uh, for the kids who most need it, as well as for the kids who may not. And that's why I think this is going to be such a painful couple of years as we, you know, see these funds disappear and we see um, these support personnel and services disappear and, and the impact that it will have on, on, on all of our kids. And Kara, I'd like to kind of go back to you on this and, you know, with the, the strong outcome numbers that are coming out of Guilford in, in regards to Superintendent Oakley's decision making and thinking about these students within the district that are going to be so heavily impacted by the resources going down. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how that is um, helping her um, come up with a narrative in regards to change that's been impacted by the creation of this project under the ESSER funding? Sure. Of course, I, I I I don't want to speak for the superintendent, um, but I think that it's, it's just keeping that the mindset um, uh, in in what's best for kids. And I think that in keeping that mindset and 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 looking at um, you know these working groups that we have going and really looking at these initiatives and where we're investing money um, and 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 really seeing what is going to give us um, the most, you know, return on our investment, what's going to help support our, our kids the most. Um, I think that's really, that's the North star uh, that we're using to really guide uh, the decisions and um, uh, you know, that, that are happening in the district. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I've had some interesting conversations lately, um, some back and forth with Susanna Loeb and NSSA and um, Amanda Neitzel at Johns Hopkins specifically about, you know, potentially building out some MTSS calculators that look at the impact of um, better integrating evidence-based yeah. high-impact tutoring into district programs and where are the cost savings to MTSS? Um, where does the investment into long, into high impact tutoring being delivered in an evidence based way offset some of those costs to get a student to graduation? Right, because if we can yeah. identify early literacy, early numeracy issues, where you know this is not a child with a learning difference, this is a child that's missed, a, you know, has just a gap in learning, um, and if we can identify them early, and you know, you know get away from the idea that they're going to get into fifth and sixth grade and not know how to read for some reason or another because they slipped through right. the cracks. That's going to become a lot, a lot less expensive kid to get to graduation if they become a tier three kid in middle school and high school. Correct, correct. Yeah, um, I, I think uh, they actually did uh, a webinar yesterday on alignment with tutoring and MTSS. Yeah, that was, um, that was great. Thank yeah, you. yeah, well, I'm sure. Yeah, it was very interesting. But yeah, really just just staying um, up to date with, with the research that that's coming out of the accelerator, I think. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that's something that that we're very invested in. Awesome. Well, I appreciate this has been great. And we're going to kind of move to questions. Um, I have one that was supplied during the registration process that I'd love to uh, to pitch over to Sasha. Um, I, you know, we know that uh, the the Fed has given us some some ideas as to um, how to file for extension. We know that some, certain states have filed for s extension. So, are superintendents thinking differently about ESSER spending since states now have a path to file for an extension? Was that something that happened before or after this survey went out? I'm really glad you asked that because there's a lot of confusion right now. There is no path to file for any extensions for any states. So the federal government has not released any kind of template that states can utilize to apply for extensions. And so um, what they did is they sent a, a letter out in September indicating that as we had requested and, and as is precedent, that they would be supplying, creating a, a late liquidation template for states to utilize. Um, we have grave concerns with the template that they have put forward. We think it has legal challenges. It has enormous administrative challenges for states and for districts. Um, and so um, we um, have expressed our concerns with that. Um, but I will say that uh, right now there is absolutely no option for a district or a state to apply for any additional time. And the only time that they would be available according to the letter that was released would apply for contracts. So this would not be a, a way to extend, um, you know, non-contracted personnel that the district may have. This is only an opportunity uh, to kind of, if, if there are delays or other really extenuating circumstances. As the department has said previously, just wanting more time to spend the funding is not reason enough to get more time. Um, and again, you know, I, I think this is an unfortunate situation where the policy and the politics and the and really hit the the practice level in in, in an unfortunate way because. Um, um, uh, not sure what happened there. Um, but yeah, it's it's an unfortunate situation where uh, there is um, this need, uh, sometimes a uh, very, very strong, good need to to extend some of these services uh, and uh, and and these contracts. Um, but, uh, you know, the federal government is saying that you really can't just do it because it's the right thing to do for kids. You have to have a better reason for that. Um, and our, our members, again, are 100 percent kid focused. We want to extend programs and services that are, are really working for them. And we think that that should be a good enough reason for extending some of this. But the federal government thinks otherwise. Oh, no, that's great, because I do think that there's quite a bit of confusion. I think there was some press that was um, that came out not too long ago that kind of led folks to believe that there was sort of a template or pathway that had already been created for states to apply. But it sounds like that there's more de there's more, there's some devil in the details of, of that of that guidance and that press. Yeah. Uh, Kara, I'd love uh, to ask. Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead, Nate, and then I'll jump in. We had some uh, questions pop into chat. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to ask Kara a quick question about um, 
I, I've heard some rumblings of of just North Carolina, you know, UNCG um, maybe supporting some other districts or helping other districts in North Carolina replicate what's happening in Guilford. Can can you can you talk about any of the initiatives that are there, or is that more of a UNCG question? Is that yeah, I think I think that would be more of a UNCG question. I know that. Um, you know, it, there are surrounding districts to us that are more rural um, and, again, trying to, you know, how how can the community help support those districts, I think, is, is where that's stemming from. Yeah, got it. I'll turn it over to you, Haley. Thank you. Um, we had a DM in the chat and I'll read it off. So how are superintendents balancing in many cases? their need for school teachers with their desire to do tutoring. Uh, that's a great question. I don't know. Tara, do you have thoughts on that? Um, I, I will say that, again, I think that we've sort of, when, when we embarked on this high dosage tutoring program, I think that um, it, we, we got more than, uh, than what we were anticipating, uh, especially with, in creating this teacher pipeline. Um, so I think that depending on the district and, and how high dosage tutoring is organized, again, we've, we've taken a very centralized approach, um, to where we hire our tutors as part-time employees in the district. Um, you know, other districts are outsourcing, um, and, and using other organizations to sort of, recruit and and um and place tutors but i think that what we have seen is that uh again some of those people the community members the the college students that may be a mathematics major or an engineering major and may have not they may just not have thought about teaching as a career um, but they get in schools and they start working with students and, um, you know, then they go on to fill teaching positions. Um, so I don't think it's really um, a, a choice that we've had to make as to, you know, whether we hire teachers or whether we hire tutors. Um, that's not to say that, you know, that won't be, again, with funding and sustainability of, of what we're doing, you know, what does that look like? Um, I, I'm not really sure, but at this point in time, uh, we're, we're also using the tutors, uh, to sort of, you know, then move, move into positions and, and, uh, have them go through and obtain a teaching license. So it's worked for us this far, thus far. <laughs> I would say, I would add to that, that, you know, um, like in Illinois, we support the Illinois tutoring initiative, which is in 94 districts. And in that particular case, they made a decision very early to make the hourly rate $50 an hour across all of their tutors. Um, they're also paying their high school students they're doing that support as well. Um, and that was a really like, that's that's enough money that even a, a teacher who's in school is gonna say, oh, you know, if I've got an opportunity to do this after school and I could grab a couple more hours, then I'd like to do that. And it's a compelling thing. The, the question of sustainability of that particular rate is another one. Um, and we've also seen a bunch of our programs move towards federal work study where they're using federal work study funds and the university is covering the, the tutor wages or the federal government through federal, federal work study is covering those wages. All right, I think we're gonna wrap it up. Um, I really appreciate both of you. This has been an awesome conversation. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Um, and as we wrap up, I'd like to summarize our key takeaways. Um, today, we've gained valuable insights into the challenges and strategies surrounding the ESSER funding cliff, the persistence of learning gaps, and the development of effective tutoring programs. These topics are not just critical, um, but they require our immediate attention and action. So I encourage each of you to actively engage with the resources offered by AASA and to learn more about the amazing tutoring program in Guilford. Their expertise and materials are invaluable tools in navigating these very complex issues, particularly as we approach the cliff. Um, a heartfelt thank you to our esteemed guests uh, for your contributions. And the, for those interested in revisiting today's conversation, 
We'll be providing all webinar resources and follow-up materials and the recording. So if you want to share it to your friends and family or whoever in the community you want uh, to learn more about these, um, these valuable assets, they'll be available on our website. And we'll also send out an email with uh, direct links for uh, um, easy access. As always, if you're looking for a technology partner to help support your district tutoring program, Pearl provides an all-in-one evidence-based solution. Once again, thank you for your time and engagement. Let's continue work together to make a positive impact in the lives of our students and the future of education. I hope you all have a great day. Thanks so much. Thanks, Nate. Thanks, Haley.